Howdy folks, I'm your host Aaron Heath. I'd like to take a moment to thank you for downloading, subscribing, and most importantly, listening to episode number 34 of the Gun Rights in Texas podcast. Now you can find the show notes for this episode by going to gunrightsintexas.com slash 034. Now on this episode, we're going to talk about the hard facts about Texas gun laws. And there's a story behind that, and we'll get to it in a moment. But first, let's go ahead and hit the gun of the show. The gun for this show is the FNH USA FS2000 Tactical. That's right, folks. We're getting a little bit bigger than a handgun this time. And not too much bigger than the Rossi Ranch Hand, but still, it's bigger. Now, for years, I've wanted a semi-auto brush gun. Anybody can grab a Marlin or a Winchester 3030. I mean, it's a really compact brush gun itself. I, however, want a semi-auto for a brush gun. The reason for that is I want something that has higher capacity, something I'm not going to be shoot one, load one in a uh, situation where I'm emptying it as fast as I can, and I wanted the ability to quickly load multiple rounds but just by changing a magazine. Well, I was in the gun store, and this is a few years ago, about this time, no less. And, uh, well, my buddy that... Uh, he's one of the owners of the business. He tells me, Hey, our distributor has a sale on these F and H USA FS 2000s. Turns out it's the FS 2000 tactical model that they had on sale. And it was kind of a sale that would, the sale was, uh, right there around black Friday. It wasn't quite there. And the idea was get it in, get your customers to buy it for Christmas. So I told him, yeah, go ahead and order me one. After that, all I had to do was come up with a optic and some kind of a sling for it. Well, in the optic category, turns out my buddy had, uh, about the time he got the gun in, he received an EOTEC, EOTEC, blah, let me get my tongue untied, an EOTEC EXPS2 holographic weapon sight. And that was pretty much what I wanted anyway, because I didn't want any magnification. I did not want, uh, I wanted a small dot reticle, one MOA dot. And the EOTech did the job. So that's what I went with. Well, the little FS2000 bullpup fitted with the EOTech, good ammunition, along with an Urban ERT sling that I picked up. Uh, I think I actually ordered it from Urban ERT's website. And the ability to share magazines and ammo with my buddies that carry AR-15s. I finally had my brush gun. Now, the FS2000 is a semi-auto only version of FN's F2000 bullpup that is designed to use the same magazines and ammunition as the AR-15 and the M16 family of rifles. Now, I want to point out right now, you do not use the polymer mags in the FS2000. They just don't fit. But I will say that the stamp steel box magazines work perfectly, so go with those. Now, the FS2000 features a forward ejection system so that the spent brass does not kick out the side, it just kind of dribbles out the front. Makes it easy to police your brass at the range if you're shooting from a stationary position because it's all going to be right there in a pile in front of you. Now, aside from the charging handle, the weapon is fully ambidextrous, and the safety selector is actually placed directly under the trigger, and it kind of serves as part of the trigger guard. I should point out that proper operation of the safety selector keeps your finger away from the trigger. Kind of a unique little setup. My understanding is the safety selector is actually identical to the one on the PS90 and the P90, but I don't know that for a fact because, well, I haven't had the FS2000 and the, and the P90 or PS90 side by side. So let's take a quick look at some specs on this. The model is the FS2000 Tactical. Now, the FS2000 Tactical does not have the factory optic, nor does it have the tri-rail that the, uh, what do they call the tri-rail model? Uh, I don't recall, but there's a model that has a tri-rail too, but it's not, that the tactical does not have that. You can order the tri-rail, it's about 110, 120 bucks, and it just snaps right on. But anyways, it's chambered in the 5.56 by 45 millimeter NATO, which means it can shoot the 223 Remington cartridge without any issues. Magazine capacity is 30 rounds with the factory magazine, although I understand that some of them do have a 10 round magazine option available. Now, the sights, they're folding backup sights, so they're not really intended to be the primary sighting system on this weapon. In fact, with my EOTech, I actually took the front sight off just to give it that much more visual clarity. And the front sight does not fold, unless they've revised the design since I bought mine. Material is polymer and steel, the weight 7.86 pounds, 
And the MSRP is unknown because they're currently between production runs right now. Some people say they've quit producing them. And technically that's true. They quit producing them until they retool the line to produce more. Now, with that said, let me just say that it's time to let you know how to get the show. And in addition to what you want to hear in this audio clip, you can also get the show on the YouTube channel by going to our website, gunrightsintexas.com. And on the website, there's a little YouTube icon at the top of the page, and you just click on it. It'll take you right to our channel. So listen up, and this will tell you how to get the show if you want to get more than just this one episode. The Gun Rights in Texas podcast is available on iTunes, on Stitcher, and in the Microsoft Windows podcast store. Of course, you can always download the show and see the show notes as well as comment by going to the website, gunrightsintexas.com. And we're back for the listener feedback segment, which... In the last episode, I made a comment that I was wondering if um, Myra Lawson and Zach Lawson are both related. Well, they both emailed me, and they basically say they're not related as far as they know. However, Myra asked that I share her email with Zach, and I did, so that they could communicate and find out for sure. Now, I do ask that when they figure this out, if they let me know, because I'm kind of curious about it. And we got a couple of more, but nobody actually said anything about sharing the sharing it. So I'm not going to touch on any of the others. We do have a, a an announcement regarding the show format. It's a minor change. However, the new to gun segment will now be replaced with the Texas legislative update segment. The reason for this is I've had a number of listeners email me saying they're not really interested in the new to guns in Texas segment. And. I placed it after the music because that's a good place to let people know, hey, you can turn it off and you don't have to listen to it anymore. But a lot of people really don't like it at all. So I'm just going to drop it and replace it with something. Well, I'm replacing it with the Texas Legislative Update segment. And the segment will run through whenever the session ends, as long as there's something to talk about. And that's another thing that people were wanting me to do was kind of keep them up to date on where things are with the legislature. Which is interesting considering that, well, the legislature hasn't even met yet, hasn't even been sworn in. It's just right now they're pre-filing bills. But you know what? That's enough of that because, you know, we got a pretty long topic ahead of us. A lot of technical information, a lot of talk about what the law is and is not. And we got a lot of myths to show that they're not facts, but they're actually myths. And, well, we got some cold hard facts about Texas gun rights to talk about. But before we do that, let me run the audio clip that will kind of share some information with you about our social media. The Gun Rights in Texas podcast is available on social media. Links to all the social media profiles can be found on the website. On Twitter, the podcast is at Gun Rights in TX. On Facebook and Google Plus, it is Gun Rights in Texas. So please be social. Now, this, this particular episode, uh, it's basically going to be called Hard Facts About Texas Gun Laws. And the reason this is the topic for this episode, there's this gentleman by the name of Rob Morse. He's from California. He blogs at slowfacts.wordpress.com. He is a co-host on the Polite Society podcast, and he writes at a number of other websites, including Land. Now, in the show notes, I'm going to include a link to the article that we're actually discussing and that article is titled Myth and Reality of Tex- or Self-Defense Laws in Texas. Now, the version of the article we'll be uh, covering is located on his Slow Facts uh, blog, which is at wordpress.com. Now, the first issue we actually have with the article is in the first par- paragraph, he says that Texas has some terrible gun laws. Now, aside from a lack of open carry and very limited campus carry, I kind of think Texas is pretty well off. And I've got a little bit of a list here. I'm going to kind of run down and give you an idea of why I think this. First off, Texas has no registration of firearms or ammunition. I mean, no ammunition registration, kind of like I think California has tried or in some places does. And there's no registration of firearms of any kind, not with the state. 
at the federal level, you know, machine guns, short barreled rifles, short barrel shotguns have to be registered. But that's for quote unquote tax purposes. Now, there are state preemption of local gun laws. Now, what this preemption thing means is that state law preempts local law, except where state law says local ordinances can exist. And in this case, state law preempts the local laws in almost every aspect of guns in Texas. There are some areas that it allows the cities, you know, a little bit of leeway. This would be, you know, firearms in parks or firearms at uh, local government meetings or firearms at things like, I don't know, um, political rallies. And the reason that was carved out of our preemption You go way back to when the Republicans had their, uh, when the Republican National Convention was held at the George R. Brown Convention Center in Houston. Now, you had a very militant group show up. They were protesting the Republican National Convention, and they were marching around with long guns. It was done as an intimidation tactic, and the legislature said, you know what, this isn't going to happen anymore. We're going to give the local authorities the ability to pass ordinances that limit this. But aside from minor things like that and the discharge of firearms, state preemption is pretty much the law of the land. Locals cannot have, local cities cannot have a ordinance banning handguns or rifles. I believe the city of San Antonio kind of figured out that their ordinance for loaded long guns, except by police officers, is not in tune with state law. Now, you do also have some other advantages Texas has, and the list is rather long, so we'll go on and move through it. So let's see where else Texas gets it right, shall we? There is no so-called safe storage requirements. There's no micro-stamping requirements. There are no private sales background check requirements. There are no licensing requirements to own a firearm or ammunition. There are no waiting periods. There's no mandatory reporting of lost or stolen firearms. There is no list of supposedly safe or approved guns. You know, kind of like California has a safe gun roster. There is no ban on so-called assault weapons. There's no magazine capacity restrictions. There's no hollow point ammunition ban. Our concealed handgun license is shall issue. That means if you meet the requirements, they cannot say, well, we don't like the color of your skin, or we don't like the way you did this, or we don't like the way you do that. It's, well, you meet the requirements. Here's your concealed handgun license. Now, California is a may issue state where you can meet all the requirements, and they'll say, eh, we don't think you need a license anyway, so no. Also, here in Texas, there is no duty to retreat if you're somewhere that you have a legal Uh, that you're legally allowed to be. We also have something called civil immunity in a self-defense shooting, which basically means that if somebody attacks me, I shoot them. Their family cannot sue me in court because I shot the breadwinner of the family while he was doing his job as illegal as it is. Because it was a good self-defense shooting, I'm immune to civil lawsuits. We do have a little bit of campus carry, although we're working to expand it. And some people may be wondering, well, what kind of campus carry does Texas have? Well, in Texas, as long as you don't go into a building, you can carry on a school premises if you have a concealed handgun license. Now, there is an effort to push uh, full campus carry through the legislature. Hopefully, uh, this particular session will be the one where we get it passed, and I'm certain our governor-elect will sign it when it makes it to his desk. Now, there's a lot more, and I'm not really going to go into them, but Texas is a great state for gun laws. I mean, we have a few things like a lack of open carry of modern handguns. We have limited campus carry. But, you know, other than that, we got a lot of great things in our gun laws or lack of gun laws that people really take for granted. Now, the next issue we have comes about two paragraphs later where Mr. Moore says, The free state of Texas might let you carry a concealed firearm at your place of business. I said they might, end of quote. Well, if it is your business, that means it's probably on property that you own or control. And in that case, you do not even need a license to carry there, okay? You can carry openly, you can carry concealed, it don't matter. It's up to you. Why? Because Texas Penal Code Section 46.02, subsection A1, which provides an exception if you're on property that you own or control to Texas Penal Code Section 4602, subsection A, 
which is where the restriction on carrying handguns is created. So basically, the the very first so-called fact that he puts out is n- not right. It's wrong, therefore, it's disproven. No point so far for Mr. Morse. Now, the biggest issue that really tears people up, and this is the one I addressed when I made comments to his blog, follows in the very next paragraph where he writes, Texas concealed carry law effectively prohibits trained and licensed concealed carry holders from carrying in hospitals, in nursing homes, and in churches. Hospitals are required to post signs prohibiting carry. Churches may exclude concealed carriers with a sign. Unfortunately, the type of sign is not defined in law or court cases. Most concealed carriers won't carry at church so they can avoid the legal problems that can come from a brush with the law, end of quote. Oh boy, there's so much fail in that statement, it's not even funny. So let's take a look at what's wrong with it. Hospital and nursing homes are listed as off-limits locations in Texas Penal Code subsection 46035, or I should rephrase that, subsection 46.035A4. Now, churches are listed as being off-limits in a nearby subsection, which is 46.035A6. I lost where I was in my show notes. And Mr. Morse would be correct if the law stopped there. But there is a subsection that comes into play that is known as Texas Penal Code subsection 46.035I that says subsections B4 and B6, among others, do not apply if the license holder was not given notice under Texas Penal Code section 30.06. Well, the thing is, Texas Penal Code section 30.06 is very specific and it is very noticeable. And we'll go into it in a moment. However... Let's go back to the hospitals because we kind of skipped over some of it. He says that hospitals have to post. Mm, No, they don't. However, hospitals, I understand that hospitals do actually have to post a 51% sign. But since the TABC has not determined that hospitals earn 51% or more of their revenue from the sales of alcoholic beverages for on-premises consumption, it does not apply to a concealed carry license holder. But you know what? That's really a minor thing because if a hospital is a private hospital, they can post and say, yes, you cannot carry here. And the way they post, they put up a sign under Section 30.6. There is a little bit of a caveat here, though. You see, if a hospital is a teaching hospital, such as one run by the, I don't know, the Texas Tech Health Sciences Center, that would be a teaching hospital, teaching hospitals or schools, therefore, they're off limits until we get campus carry passed. Once campus carry is passed, well, that kind of goes away. When I say campus carry, I mean full campus carry. But you know what? Let's go back and take a look at uh, Penal Code Section 30.6. Now, that's 30.06. Kind of like the rifle, except instead of a dot dash, there's a dot. Okay, I sound like I'm talking about Morse code now. All right, moving on. Texas Penal Code Section 30.06a says... A license holder commits an offense if the license holder, one, carries a handgun under the authority of subchapter H, chapter 411, government code on property of another without effective consent and receives notice that entry on the property by a license holder with a concealed handgun was forbidden or remaining on the property with a concealed handgun was forbidden and failed to depart. And basically what this is, is that There's two parts. You know, there's a part that says carrying the concealed handgun, and two, they receive notice. Now, basically what's happening here is 30.6a is establishing when criminal trespass happens. 30.6b says when a, uh, basically says how you uh, receive notice as a license holder or somebody gives notice as a property owner or somebody with the authority to speak for them. And 30.6b, actually, the way it's worded is, for purposes of this section, a person receives notice if the owner of the property or someone with the apparent authority to act for the owner provides notice that the person by, or provides notice to the person by oral or written communication. So basically what uh, 30.6b does is it establishes who can create the restriction for trespass. Moving on to 30.6c, we are actually getting into where definitions are established. So 30.6c1 says, 
Entry has the meaning assigned by Section 30.05b. Standard criminal trespass right there, no problem. 30.06c2 says, License holder has the meaning assigned by 46.035f. And 30.06c3 is where it gets interesting with the written communication. In fact, it says written communication means A, a card or other document on which is written language identical to the following, pursuant to Section 30.06 Penal Code Trespass by holder of license to carry a concealed handgun, a person licensed under Subchapter H of Chapter 411 Government Code Concealed Handgun Law may not enter this property with a concealed handgun, or B, a sign posted on the property that, and this gets a little bit convoluted, eh, no it doesn't. It's got three little provisions here. The first provision is, includes language described by paragraph A in both Spanish and English. Hmm, interesting. It's got to be in two languages on the sign. And it has to have the language described by paragraph A. And paragraph A says that exact language. Hmm, okay appears in contrasting colors with block letters at least one inch in height. Very interesting. One inch tall letters, two languages, lots of words, lots of letters, and it must be displayed, or, and three, is displayed in a conspicuous manner clearly visible to the public. So basically, they cannot put this sign behind an object, they cannot make it real tiny, and it's going to be a pretty big sign, and a lot of people, because there'll be a part in English and a part in Spanish, will actually do two signs. This is a huge sign to put up to say, I don't want concealed carry here. Most churches are not going to do it. They might give written notice on their, I don't know, their little uh, handouts they give when you walk in the door, possibly. But if you don't take it, you don't effectively receive notice. And if you don't effectively receive notice, well, you're not prohibited from carrying. So really, they don't want to do that. Now, 30.6D says an offense under this section is a Class A misdemeanor. 30.6E says it is an exception to the application of this section that the property on which the license holder carries a handgun is owned or leased by a government entity that is not a premises or other place on which the license holder is prohibited from carrying a handgun under 4603 or 46035. No hospitals that are privately owned can post 30.6 signs. Churches can post 30.6 signs. But if they post them, it's by their own decision. It's not required by law. So basically, this is another issue where his so-called fact is actually a myth. No points for Mr. Morse on this one. And then he moves on and he touches on the NFA issue. It's not really an issue. However, the way he words it and the way it's worked in law, we're going to give him that one and move on. So basically, he's got one fact right, two facts wrong. But then he goes on to claim, did you know it is illegal for a Texas gun store to show a sign of a handgun in their shop window? End of quote. Interestingly enough, the only results I found in Google for this claim are for his article and places where his article has appeared in news feeds. And there is one other reference I did find in Google and that was on Cal Gunn's website, or it might have been an article referring to a Cal Gunn's lawsuit. I forget which it is. But there was one other reference. Well, since I did not find anything about the law in Google, I turned to another search tool. And that search tool is on the Texas legislature's website where you can actually search all the laws and the constitution of the state of Texas and see what the law actually is. I conducted a number of searches with the keywords of handgun and firearm and this and that and so on. After spending probably a good hour or two searching and getting no results, at least no results for his supposed law, and I had some pretty broad searches. I just searched for handgun, and I searched just for firearm. Well, guess what? I got no results on the website for the Texas legislature either. Maybe Mr. Morse is looking at some local ordinance which wouldn't be the state of Texas, it'd be his local ordinance, but even that is suspect at best. I think what happened was he got his information from the Cal Guns Foundation, who was either just making it up as they go along, or they got bad information from somewhere, because I found no such law in Texas. Maybe there's a federal law. Who knows? I didn't look at federal laws. If that's the case, well, Cal Guns lawsuits actually aimed in the wrong direction instead of the state of California, 
They need to enjoin the federal government as a defendant as well. But I don't know if that's the case or not. However, there's no state law I can find that says it's illegal. And because of this, well, this myth is a fact. I mean, this fact is not in fact, it's a myth. No points for Mr. Morse on this one. State of Texas 3, Mr. Morse 1. But you know what? If somebody can find where the state law says it's illegal for a shop, gun store, or anything like that to have an advertisement with a handgun, then please feel free to send it to me and I'll retract what I've said here. I can't change it because it's a recorded podcast, but in the next episode, I'll change it. And in the show notes, I'll put a comment or not a comment, but I'll actually uh, put a notice in the show notes that, yeah, it's actually against the law and it's here. But I don't think you'll find it because I couldn't. And I did a lot of research. But getting back to the subject, perhaps the article that uh, Mr. Morse wrote should be one reality in a whole bunch of myths about Texas gun laws. But you know what? Let's go a step further. Let's take a look at uh, the comments that I left and the response I got. Now, a lot of the commenters on the Ammo Land article are full of hate and poor manners. I commented there, but then I went to his website where he actually controls everything and I posted a comment there. And I have to say the comments on his personal blog are a bit more social and it's a better place to comment anyway. You don't have such vitriol and uninformed postings that go on like at Ammo Land. So on his blog, I posted the following. I posted the following comment to the Ammo Land version of your article. Texas Penal Code section or Texas Penal Code 46.035B does place those locations off limits. However, 46035I requires that notice be provided under Texas Penal Code Section 30.06 for that prohibition to actually exist. The 51% sign hospitals are required to post does not meet that qualification. Additionally, the signage required to give notice under Texas Penal or TPC, which stands for Texas Penal Code Section 30.06, is very specific and very well defined by law. The article is only propagating myths, not dispelling them. And in response to my comment, I received, Aaron, can you cite case laws supporting your interpretation of permissible signs at churches? And I responded with the following. No need to cite case law. I can cite codified law. For the record, there has been, or there is actually no known case law. The prohibition reads as follows, and we go into a lot of the material we covered here on the podcast so far. Well, a gentleman I know from the Texas CHO forum uh, posted to it, and he goes by the annoyed man. Of course, over on the Texas CHL forum, we kind of abbreviate his name to Tam. But anyways, the annoyed man posted, In support of Aaron Heath, he is dead right on. I and lots of my friends totally legally carry in church because our churches have not either posted a compliant 30-06 sign or give us verbal notice not to. By the way, this is the way the law has been interpreted by those in authority since 46035I was added to the law. The reason there is no case law, because there are no cases. The reason there are no cases, because nobody goes to trial for carrying in church. The reason nobody goes to trial for carrying in church, because most churches do not post 30-06 and therefore nobody is breaking the law. Now, he goes on with the following. Asking someone to provide case law for something where there is no case law is like asking that person to prove a negative. It's an illogical request, but the reason for why there is no case law is easily explained and and understandable. Hope that helps. You know what? Tam is right. There is no case law. And when a church does post a sign that does not comply with 30.6 and somebody carries past it and gets caught, well, nobody really ever goes to trial for that simply because there's no crime and nobody wants to take a case that they'll lose. So basically, these cases always get dismissed before they even go to trial. Now, most law enforcement officers also understand the law in this regard. So very seldom does anybody ever get arrested for it. Basically, what you have here is you have a very well-defined set of codified laws that even if it goes to trial and somebody is convicted, when it goes to the appellate level where case law is established, odds are it's it's going to be overturned. Unless you just have an activist judge that's saying, okay, this is what the law says, but it means the exact opposite. Now, I'm certain if they have sign, a sign with letters that are nine-tenths of an inch tall, that would be, well, they did their best. You know, the sign had some shrinkage when it was printed, so we, well, we're going to enforce it. Something like that may be so. But when it comes right down to it, the signage requirement is very well-defined. 
There's no two ways about it. If you decide to carry in a church that does not have a 30 out 6 sign, you're perfectly legal. And if it has a 30 out 6 sign, maybe you shouldn't be going to church there. However, Mr. Morse did not reply to myself or to Tam. He replied to somebody else later, but as beside the point. However, on the Polite Society podcast number 285, which, as of the time this was recorded, was the most recent episode, they may drop another episode before this one is released. I don't know. I don't really know what their schedule is. He doubles down and he compounds his problem slightly. He repeats his erroneous claims, but he qualifies them with Texas denies the right of self-defense in many hospitals and churches. He then says they also treat some gun owners as guilty until proven innocent. Well, let's take a look at those. He said Texas denies the right of self-defense in many hospitals and churches. Texas does not. Texas provides the property owners the ability to uh, say what goes on on their property. It's not the state of Texas denying the right of self-defense on that property. It's the property owner denying the right of self-defense on that property. The exception to that is hospitals that are run as schools. Those are off limits because they're schools. But let's take another look at the some gun owners are guilty and or they also treat some gun owners as guilty until proven innocent. And this one kind of annoys me. There is no basis for this. I think this is a reference to how the NFA uh, issue is done. Texas says NFA items are illegal, but it's a defense to prosecution if you have the tax stamp. There is no you are guilty until proven innocent. It's these are illegal unless you have a tax stamp. There's a big difference. So basically, what I want to do, I want to ask Mr. Morse to correct the article or issue a retraction. Alternatively, he can disclose his sources and admit that he did not research things properly. But those are really the only three options that will make a lot of people happy about this. What can I say? I want to address Mr. Morse here. All of my sources are in the open. I can cite what the law in Texas is. I can point you to where it's at on the web from the state of Texas own website. And you know what? When I make a statement, I can back it up. Mr. Morse? I challenge you to do the same for your statements. Rather than make nebulous claims that have little to no basis in fact, why don't you go out there, do a little research, and show what really is the case? Now, you call your blog Slow Facts. You have the tagline, Fast opinions come and go. Here are the slow facts. And yet, your article has only one fact, and even that's nebulous at best. And ironically, you do propagate a lot of opinion in that article. So... Let me put it this way. I think you need to sit down and you need to look at the actual facts. You need to say, well, this isn't a bunch of Texans getting their panties in a twist because they take offense that I'm saying something negative about their great state. And you need to consider that, well, we're taking offense that you're actually propagating myths that make it harder for us to defend what actually happens in the legislature. If we're having to go out here and stomp out these little fires that start up, somebody saying, well, we need to change the law so you can carry at church and the state doesn't keep you from it. Well, we got to deal with that as well as deal with pushing for open carry. If we're over here fighting this uh, legislation that's poorly written because somebody was referred to your blog and they say, well, it's illegal to carry in a hospital, so... We're going to, I want to push this law. It's going to be written so that hospitals are no longer off limits at all, but we're going to do it with this language here, and that language is actually bad. Well, we got to fight this bad bill or get a committee substitute or have it amended where it's no longer bad, and that takes away precious political capital that we could be using to push campus carry, and campus carry will do more for hospital carry than changing the laws regarding hospitals. Does Texas have some bad gun laws? Yeah. We prohibit open carry of modern handguns. We prohibit the carry of firearms inside schools. Until you walk up past the threshold of the door, you're perfectly legal. We need to fix these problems. However, it becomes more difficult to fix these problems if we're having to go over here and correct people about made-up problems that don't even exist. So, Mr. Morse, check your facts. Issue a statement where you admit you were wrong or go back and fix your article. Alternatively, post your sources and explain that you use these sources and you didn't go back and actually check what they had. 
He just ran with something that was said by someone else. And I'll, I'll actually go a step further. Mr. Morse is a podcaster. I'm certain he has the ability to do a mix minus on his system that he uses to podcast, or if he doesn't even uh, use a system, he may just Skype into somebody that has a system. Uh, I have the ability to mix minus myself. If Mr. Morse wants to come on and address his article here on the Gun Rights in Texas podcast, he's welcome. All he has to do is send me an email. My email is Aaron at gunrightsintexas.com. And we'll arrange a time when me and him can both sit down on the computer. We'll have a talk. I can record it. He can record it. I won't edit it out. If he uses any bad language, I'll just cover it up or I'll give an explicit tag. I don't care which. And hey, we'll we'll put him on if he wants to be on. I have no problem addressing these issues. Is he misinformed? Is he running some kind of agenda? I don't know. However, there's a call out to him personally. Defend your facts, and now he gets to do it. With that said, I think it's time to wrap up the topic of the show, and we'll move on to the news. And before we do that, let's do the contact segment. If you want to contact the podcast, please send email to Aaron at GunRightsInTexas.com, or you can leave a comment on the webpage, which is GunRightsInTexas.com. However, if you want to leave a voicemail and be featured on the show, then please do so by dialing 409-292-6736. Now we're going to touch on the news, and we have just two news articles. They're both political. On earlier episodes, I predicted that at least one of Bloomberg's groups would get involved in Texas politics, and that it would probably be Moms Demand Action. Guess what? I wasn't wrong. Now, Bloomberg's mommy's demanding illegal action from mayors of any town, or is it mayors of every town, also known as MDA, has stated they are prepared to fight open carry legislation in Texas. With the deep pockets that they can reach into, we need to be ready for a political fight that may be the political fight of the century. I mean, look at look at what these groups have been able to do. Supposedly, they launched a six-figure campaign against Kroger. Oddly enough, that didn't seem to go anywhere. And, well, who knows? Maybe they'll launch a massive financial campaign against Texas senators and representatives. Who knows? However, we got to be ready to fight this. We may have to fight it as the TSRA. We may have to fight it as Open Carry Texas as much as I dislike their leadership. However, everybody may have to get on board and everybody may have to uh, make calls to their representatives, knock on their neighbor's doors and get their neighbors to make calls to their representatives. However, if we want to get open carry passed, we better be ready for a fight. And if you go to the show notes, you'll find a link to the article that's actually covering where the statement was made that MDA was ready to have the fight. Now, the next article has a headline of the number of women getting CHLs doubles. The article states that in 2010, DPS issued 22,000 CHLs to women, and in 2013, it issued 67,000. Now, that's more like triples, but okay. We don't know how many was issued in 2011 or 2012 from the article. I could go to the DPS website and actually get that information, but it's not worth the time. The fact that more women are carrying concealed handguns to defend themselves show that self-defense is not just a boys' club, And it shows what many of us already knew, which is that women can be independent and defend themselves as well. Now, this article, like the previous one, can be found on the website in the show notes. Show notes are at gunrightsintexas.com slash 034. So it's time to wrap the show up, and I'm going to hit the exit music. After that, we'll have the Texas legislative update. And if you don't want to hear the Texas legislative update, then all I got to say is stay safe and carry responsibly. Thank you for listening to the Gun Rights in Texas podcast. Please leave a review on iTunes or send feedback to the host. Your input will be used to improve the show. Stay safe and please carry responsibly. Welcome to the Texas Legislative Update. If you were hoping to hear the new to guns in Texas, well, 
we have replaced that segment at least until after the legislative session ends with the legislative update segment. And the first thing we're going to do is we're going to go back and we're going to revisit House Bill 195. Charles Cotton has revised the Texas Firearms Coalition's position on HB 195 due to confusing language regarding the interaction between Texas Penal Code Section 46035 and Texas Penal Code Section 30.06. TFC's position is now neutral, but it will support the bill if that issue is corrected. You can go to the Texas Firearms Coalition website to get more information. Then we're going to move on. We're going to touch on two new bills that were filed. House Bill 308. I actually like that number. And the bill's important too. This bill was filed on 11-17 of 2014. And basically, it removes off-limits locations for concealed handgun license holders. TFC's position on the bill is support it. My position on the bill? Support it. This bill is super important. It could be more important than anything outside of actually passing concealed carry and the 30-06 sign. So, you know what? Let's get this thing passed and let's get it out there. Let's improve the conditions for concealed carry in Texas. And then we have House Bill 353. Now, this bill was filed on 11-20 of 14, and it has two issues. It applies only in counties with populations less than 50,000, and it exempts emergency service personnel that are answering calls from Texas Penal Code Section 30-06, as well as the fact it exempts them from Texas Penal Code's uh, section or subsections 46035B and C. Texas Firearms Coalition's position on the bill is that it is going to oppose, but it would support it if Section 3 removing an exemption to 46035B and C were removed. My position on the bill? I would like it if all it did was remove the uh, restriction on 30 6 for emergency services personnel responding to calls, and if it Removed, ex you know what, if it was, say, rewrote on the 46035 B and C sections where it just eliminated those restrictions altogether for everybody, I wouldn't mind that either. But I think the uh, population less than 50,000 in the county is a bad idea. And I think giving a select group a exemption to 46035 and any piece of it is a bad idea. Emergency services personnel, such as EMTs and firefighters, you know, I can see giving them an exception to 30 out 6 that does not apply to other people. As long as they're in the performance of their duties, I might not like it, but I wouldn't oppose it. So my personal position is I'm neutral on it, on this bill. Uh, if where, where TFC would support it, I'd be neutral. And my position is I'm opposed to it as it's written. Let me put it that way. So... That wraps it up for this episode of the Gun Rights in Texas podcast. Stay safe and carry responsibly.